the commission happened through you, Tom, uh, obviously asking. I was one of the six, I believe, composers that, that uh, you and the museum decided to commission uh, to do work uh, related to the museum and for the museum. Um, so that's how the commission came about. But my idea to do something in the atrium of the museum uh, came about from my prior visit uh, where we were together with the Jack Quartet premiering uh, my music for them. Uh, and at that time, I remember just being in the, being, being in the atrium and, and, and loving it. Uh, so when you asked me, you know, would you want to do something, you know, uh, at the museum, that was the first thing I, I knew I wanted to make music there. I think it's also fun uh, to experience how the audience adapts to unusual settings, like even if it's just moving around into a new space, they like reorder themselves. And sometimes people are like sitting, in the case of a museum gallery, maybe sitting like right on the floor, like right next to you, or, you know, peeking over someone's head way off in the distance. And just that slight change in, um, in setting, I think changes the way people listen and the way that I uh, interact with them. I agree. I enjoy that difference. It's a different type of ritual. I mean, I, I love the concert hall ritual. I love musicians coming on stage and clapping and, and bow. I love all of that. But I think galleries and museums offer different uh, alternative uh, listening experience, alternative, you know, you can think compositionally from a different perspective if you're thinking for the space uh, and you're not taking granted that it's just a, you know, whatever. Con typical concert stage. I'm not going to think about that. That's a different kind of uh, approach to composition then. Actually, what, one that comes to mind was we did this cage piece in the Calder exhibition at the Whitney and tons of people were coming in to see the Calder. It was like everyone's got to see this thing and it was like we were playing this piece that we were again spatialized around it and like there'd be like we'd play like one sound and many seconds of silence and like one sound and it was just like the most extreme contrast between the, <laughs> the amount of people that were there and then people would come up to us and look up and like wait what is happening someone's playing a note why did he play that note why did he why is this person playing such weird random stuff and then they that starts to feed into it was like a way more complex interactive experience than i had you know if people knew that okay this piece is going to happen and we're going to quietly listen to it it would have been a totally different thing but having the un unaware you know springing it on people thing was a really interesting kind of social experiment what's coming up next i mean we're in this unusual place in life um can you share with me uh, what's the current thinking for the quartet or for working up new repertoire or old repertoire or where are we all where are we going how are we gonna get through all this we're in kind of an interesting place where we don't know when we'll be able to be on stage again. The threshold seems to keep moving later and later. Uh, maybe it's somewhere in August right now. Um, but I, but the quartet's been talking a lot about what are we going to do between the end of quarantine and the beginning of performing again. And I think we might try to take on a bunch of uh, recording projects that have been sort of brewing and uh, and just maybe living in the studio a little bit. Yeah, it's like, it's interesting that we keep we've been talking about spaces and stuff, and uh, it's just making me hunger for being able to get back into an actual musical space together. Since we've been in this virtual world for a while, and we're going to be in a virtual, we may be social distancing for a while. We may have to to live with you know the recorded medium as being the best way to create new content. Jenk, how are you? Uh finding this time in terms of composition and time off from people well like chris said i i really i have a hunger for places where uh, music happens and, and people come together to enjoy it i mean it's, you know it's, that's i share that with everybody else um i'm but i you know I, I guess this kind of time also makes you think a lot about your friends and family around you know the country or the world and uh so uh, i I had an idea to say, you know, I'm going to send a little sound to all my friends. 
So I recorded this, the sound that I was playing around with and sent it to my close music friends, including uh, John and Chris uh, and many others. Uh, and I said, you know, just record a sound back, whatever, on your phone. You know, it doesn't have to be anything special if you want to scream or talk or play your instrument, whatever it is. Some people sent water uh, bubbles. One person was playing around with cell phone and sent that. Somebody sang. Chris was doing a, I was expecting a violin or something from Chris and uh, he did some throat singing. So I'm receiving back these uh, wonderful gifts uh, from my friends and, and it's a way to say hello. And you know, these are all amazing musicians that are sending me their, their sounds from their home. Well, what are you doing with that uh, collection of uh, male art that's coming your way? Yeah, it might be a piece, but it's already, it already, it's just already, is sort of doing, fulfilling its purpose, I feel like, this exchange of sound uh, when we don't have the live one, you know. It'll do for now, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs>